Okay, then, good morning. Uh, I'm glad to introduce to you this morning Professor Katarzyna Dzubalska Kowacek from uh, University of Poznan uh, in Poland. Uh, Professor Katarzyna has been working on a, on a model, a phonetic grammar indeed, uh, that she called uh, net auditory uh, distance. And this is a, a very uh, interesting model since uh, it um, provides us with a, a, a measure about complexity uh, involved in clusters, uh, in Polish especially, but also she uh, tries to uh, uh, pose to, to, to employ the model for clusters in English. Uh, by doing that, we can compare the phonotetics between uh, uh, Polish and uh, English so that we can um, foresee some uh, difficulties for learners of second language when they are trying to acquire a different language. So, um, Professor Katarzyna uh, is going to... Um, uh, uh, talk to us about this model, and after that, um, I'm pleased. Um, I'm glad. Uh, it's be my. It's it will be my pleasure to um, make uh, some questions you can address to us uh, on our chat. So, um, Professor Katarzyna. Um, you have to you have to unmute your mic yeah thank you very much adelaide um, for this uh, nice uh, introduction uh, very kind and um, um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be part of this event, uh, uh, Linguists Online. So thank you very much, the organizers, for the invitation. I think this is a great idea. Uh, so let me now turn to my talk. Right. As already um, announced, it's about phonotactics and uh, my model of explaining clusters using net auditory distance and more phonotactics. Um, okay. Uh, well, let me start with a, with a little preamble uh, where I state uh, my basic views uh, about phonology. So first of all, I believe that phonology needs to account for uh, structure and composition of sound sequences, and I suppose every phonologist does. Uh, however, not every phonologist uses the particular theory I'm, uh, I'm working within. My approach is grounded in the epistemology of natural linguistics. Um, uh, natural linguistics in the sense of uh, natural phonology first, stemming from the works of uh, uh, Patricia Donegan and David Stem, and later on developed into the larger framework of natural linguistics mm -hmm. by Wolfgang Dressler in Vienna and his collaborators, and then um, uh, many other people in, in especially in Europe. Uh, the model of phonotactics, which uh, I'll be uh, presenting, is embedded in the theory of beats and binding phonology, which is of um, my own making, and the model of morphonotactics, uh, uh, stemming from natural morphology, is uh, the one uh, that we have uh, proposed uh, together with uh, um, uh, Uli Dressler, with Professor Dressler. So the main aim of the talk is to show uh, how cluster preferability can be measured. It can, can we find any measure uh, um, uh, to tell uh, which uh, clusters are preferred? And notice that I am using the term preferability rather than, for instance, correctness or legality. So I'm not talking about legal clusters or correct clusters, or I'm not talking about constraints on clusters. I'm talking about how preferred clusters might be on a scale in a hierarchy. So this is, this is characteristic of my approach. Um, so in more detail, to, uh, the aim of my talk is to present the model of phonotactic grammar in which uh, 
well formedness conditions, well formedness of consonant clusters uh, is measured by net auditory distance. So NAD stands for net auditory distance obtaining between segments in a cluster. I want to show the impact of morphology on phonotactics, which actually results in more phonotactics, uh, since I believe that this is uh, being often neglected. Uh, I want to demonstrate that the interaction between phonotactics and morphonotactics provides a richer insight into the understanding of cluster, cluster complexity. Um, in particular, uh, while a phonotactic grammar operates on basic, non-derived lexical forms, uh, morphonotactics takes care of the remaining morphologically complex forms. And as we very well know, in any language, uh, there are more of them. So uh, the outline of my talk looks as follows. Um, I want to say just um, a very, very, make a very, very short note about beats and binding phonology, which is the syllable less theory. So this is the message I need to convey to you. Then I'll present a net auditory distance model and, and talk about the phonotactic calculator, which I need uh, for the model to work. And then about more phonotactics, some, uh, some exemplary data, um, and uh, the latest revision of NAD. And of course, then uh, I will finish with some outlook. So very shortly, bits and binding phonology, the main thing that, that uh, needs to be said is that it is a theory which does not rely on the syllable as the basic unit of structure. In other words, the syllable in BNB phonology is an epiphenomenon. Um, it, is an, it is emergent, if you like, due to principle principles phonotactic preferences. So I believe that uh, first come the preferences, which uh, stem from some general principles. And, and, and if you like, the, the, due to the, the, the operation of the phonotactic preferences, um, um, a, a syllable um, might emerge if this is, if this, the structure that emerges, uh, you want to call the syllable, right? But it, it is in the words of Fenneman, an epiphenomenon. The phonotactic preferences are responsible for different degrees of intersegmental cohesion, uh, which mm, in turn uh, determines the behavior of segments and creates the impression of syllable structure. So the main thing is how segments um, coexist in a structure. So uh, this intersegmental cohesion is the, 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 the key um, uh, term here um, and, in, and indeed, uh, as a result, you might uh, get the impression of an epiphenomenal syllable structure. But that's, that's all I wanted to say about the beats and binding phonology because this explains uh, for later why I'm not referring to the syllable uh, while talking about uh, phonotactics. All right, so let me, let me now talk about this uh, NAD uh, model. Um, well, it is meant to be a preferability measure as I stated in, in my first slide. So the suggested measure is based on uh, phonetic contrast um, um, uh, between sounds. They are the, 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 the phonetic sounds are more easily recognized, learned and transmitted when they contrast well with the neighbors. So this means that the, this, this contrast, contrast works both for recognition, meaning uh, perception and understanding of the structure, for the acquisition of structure, as well as for transmission of structure, both in the sense of learning and in the sense of uh, historical change. Thus, uh, uh, CV sequences are more preferred than sequences of two or more consonants, uh, which we, we call clusters, uh, they are learned and transmitted more easily and are historically more stable. Why CV sequences? Well, because in a CV sequence, consonant vowel sequence, you can actually obtain the maximum phonetic contrast. Um, among clusters, once you have them, uh, less preferred clusters are less stable and more prone to disappear than the more preferred ones. So, so you could say we build a kind of hierarchy here, starting with the CV, which is the most preferred, um, and then uh, sort of sustainable and, and, uh, and stable in a language, 
but then once you have clusters, then the more preferred ones um, better uh, stay uh, for, for longer than the less preferred ones. At least this is the idea, right, of this model. So um, I refer to the contrast between sounds as the net auditory distance uh, NAD between them. Um, NAD reflects at least two dimensions. Uh, notice that I'm saying at least two dimensions because this is an open list, it might be expanded. Um, but those two major dimensions are manner of articulation on the one hand, which is uh, um, reflected in sonority profiles and place of articulation, which is reflected in so-called color differences between consonants, be it palatal, labial, velar. Um, th there may be more of those dimensions, like for instance, voicing uh, or sonority, uh, sonorant obstruent distinction. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, preferability, however, also depends on the position of a cluster in a word, is it initial, medial, or final? And also on uh, morphological factors. Since morphological operations can stabilize clusters that would seem to be dispreferred from a purely phonological perspective. This means that, um, uh, that morphology has an upper hand over, uh, over phonology here, right? And uh, actually, uh, actually might um, over, uh, overrule uh, phonological preference. Um, okay, so so uh, from what what I have said so far, um, um, uh, uh, we can we can summarize that measures there are uh, there are uh, the measure one measure of cluster markedness is NAD and that other distance. However, there is another measure, namely size of a cluster. So. In other words, a length of a cluster, a complexity of a cluster, right? So it, it matters um, uh, as well. Uh, the rationale behind this model phonotactics is to counteract the preference for CV. As we said, uh, as I said uh, some slides ago, I mean, the CV is the, uh, the one which um, prevails uh, on the basis of contrast. So if and the CV preference is, is, is well evidenced uh, in phonological work. Of course, there's always, there's always um, some exception that you may find, and here I'm referring to Hyman's uh, work. Um, but anyway, assuming the overwhelming preference for CV, if we were not counteracting it, any more complex uh, sequence like CCV, for instance, would tend to reduce to CV, so this is consonant reduction, or it might become a CV, CV. So you, here you would have an, a, a vowel parenthesis repairing the, the structure, or it might even become a VC, CV with a, with a um, prosthesis, right? So in all those cases, uh, there is like some kind of a repair uh, uh, going on towards CV. Uh, so this is one basic uh, basic rationale of the model, how, we, how I'm going to build NAD. Now, the second thing is that uh, the, the, this, the principle of perceptual contrast, which I generally referred to already. And this um, means both uh, that I'm referring here to the semiotic principle of fig and ground, uh, which is a well-known semiotic principle, a well-known psychological principle of perception, not only, of course, in an auditory uh, domain, but also in other domains. Uh, and uh, also to the phonetic, purely phonetic um, uh, um, works, uh, like, for instance, this one by Ohala here, um, uh, where he sta states that larger modulations have more survival value than lesser ones, and therefore will persist in languages. So. Uh, acoustically speaking, uh, uh, the more you modulate the, um, the sound, uh, the more chance it has uh, to, uh, uh, to survive as a structure in a language. So, um, so uh, um, summing up this bit, classes of consonants persist thanks to the adequate distribution of the auditory contrast across the world. So in order to have classes at all, I believe we need to have this kind of um, adequate distribution of the auditory contrast across uh, words. So um, the um, 
uh, net other distance principle, which is uh, which is the um, uh, the one that uh, the net auditory distance relies on defines cluster preferability in relation to the position in the word, initial, medial, and final. So the position in the word is crucial here. The principle reads, a cluster is preferred if it satisfies a pattern of distances specified by the universal phonotactic preference relevant for its position in, a, in, in the word. So, um, so there is a, there is a, a certain a pattern of distances, which I summarize in terms of universal phonotactic preferences. And the, those preferences uh, describe clusters in a given position of a word. So either it's initial, medial, or final. So for example, uh, if you take an initial double cluster C1, C2, V, NAD, net order distance, uh, obtaining between C1 and C2 is expected to be greater than or equal to NAD between C2 and V. So the, 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 the distance between the consonants is greater than the distance between the consonant and the vowel neighboring on it. Well, maybe one more uh, one more word here. Um, the 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 idea is here again exactly uh, working against the CV, right? So if the distance, the contrast, right? Because that actually describes the the, the auditory contrast, right? So if this auditory contrast uh, were greater between C two V, this would be our ideal CV. So in this way, we would lose. Uh, the, the, the first consonant of this cluster, right? So in order not to lose it, you need to obtain a greater distance between the consonants than actually the, the distance between the consonant neighboring on the vowel. So um, what are those uh, what are those uh, parameters which uh, which I'm using to measure that? I already mentioned uh, place of articulation, POA, and manner of articulation, and MOA. Um, and here I'm using also uh, uh, the, the, the third measure, which is sonorant obstruent distinction. So it's either one or zero, right? So either you have a sonorant obstruent in, in a cluster or you have two sonorants or two obstruents, right? So, um, well, actually in, 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 in the previous version of NAD, um, I, I was using voice, right? So voiced voiceless. Um, uh, contrast. Uh, however, uh, later on, I concluded that uh, it is less um, fine. It gives you le uh, uh, lesser uh, uh, resolution um, of clusters because clusters tend clusters of consonants tend to assimilate in voice, right? So you would either have um, across the language of the world, right? So you would either have voiceless or voice clusters, of course, with some notable exceptions. So then I, I, I concluded that the, the measure of sonorant versus obstruent, whereas sonorants tend to be all voiced and obstruents may be both voiced and voiceless, could be a better measure. But as I said uh, at the start, uh, the parameters, uh, the list of parameters is open. So how, how is then, um, it's still about measuring NAD, right? How is then this distance calculated, right? Well, NAD is then a sum of distances between those distances I mentioned between consonants and consonant of the vowel uh, in terms of manner, place, and, um, and the sonorant obstruent SO uh, distinction. Uh, so uh, one more thing that um, I, I will show you in a moment how, how this is actually calculated. But one more thing I want to mention here is that uh, I call NAD auditory, right? Auditory or perceptual distance. Um, and it is expressed in combinations of articulatory features and also acoustic cues, which eventually bring about the auditory effect. Because if, if you ask me why, why it's then auditory and not articulatory, because it's about the effect that articulatory features uh, bring about, right? As a result, the effect is auditory. So um, uh, this table is a kind of preliminary table. This is why I call it universal, right? Uh, which already shows, um, uh, in short, 
um, uh, how uh, uh, I envisage the, um, uh, the the counting, right? The, the the calculation of the distance. So uh, as you can see, I assign numbers, and this is a, a, an, an arbitrary assignment, right? So I assigned arbitrary numbers to um, horizontally uh, manners of articulation. Here is the simplest possible because you, you, I start with vo vowels and then go to sonorants and obstruents and sonorants are split into stops and approximants and obstruents are split into stops, fricatives and, and affricates. So, uh, so I assign numbers to manners horizontally and, and uh, vertically I assign numbers to places of articulation. And the place articulation, again, it's, a, it's uh, one of the most basic scales. Uh, actually, this one is the one uh, proposed years ago by Peter Ladefogel. However, um, languages, um, well, they, they tend to differ. Um, they tend to differ in terms of, um, in terms of uh, consonantal inventories. Uh, so, um, so, for instance, for English, if you look at English now, you, um, the, the, the scale for manner is uh, from zero to five. Um, uh, well, the scale for, for plays is also is from one to five, but you can see that here I've introduced some finer uh, distinctions. So for instance, liquids are split into two points, right? And two, two half points. And also an affricate uh, is situated in between a stop and a fricative. And when you look at uh, when you look at at um, uh, places of articulation again, uh, there is um, uh, uh, there is a finer uh, division of labial and finer division of coronal and also finer division of dorsal uh, uh, of uh, among the uh, among the places. Now. Um, uh, for Polish, um, uh, actually the numbers are pretty similar. Um, however, because the consonants are partly uh, partly different, um, uh, so for instance, uh, what would be characteristic here that glides are split uh, into the glides which are nasalized and glides which are not. Uh, you have many more fricatives, um, and therefore the the coronal is split into uh, three different positions. So. Uh, so this means that um, such an ad table of, of, uh, uh, of consonants is actually language specific to quite an extent. I mean, we start uh, with, a, uh, with a universal table, um, but, um, uh, but then uh, we arrive at uh, finer distinctions uh, which differ uh, for particular uh, languages. Uh, you could call it final resolution. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's now um, look at an example of how this calculation goes. So uh, again, I'm taking this simplest um, uh, preference as, as an example for uh, uh, initial CC, initial double um, cluster. So um, so first, I calculate the the, st the the distance in terms of manners in between C1 and C2. Um, and I subtract them, right? So say this in this case it's five uh, minus two. In um, uh, in the case of a cluster like per, right? This is a cluster like in uh, in the Polish word prawda, right? Uh, and then I subtract the, the distance in terms of places of articulation. In this particular case, this is one minus two point three, and then. Um, in, in the sum, uh, the, the, last, uh, the last parameter is the, this SO, um, uh, and uh, it's either one or zero. In this particular case, it's one because P is an obstruent and R is a sonorant. And then uh, goes the, uh, comes the calculation for the distance between a consonant and the neighboring vowel. Since vowels here are not in any way differentiated uh, in terms of color, uh, it will come later um, in, the, in the next version of the of the um, of NAD, uh, but here they are not differentiated. They are just vowels, all of them. So uh, for for this distance, I, I I can only use manner of articulation and SO. So in this case, it's um, uh, two minus zero, uh, and no distinction between R and vowel. In, in they are both sonorants. So if you look at, at the result in numbers, if it's 5.3 for C1, C2, and it's 2 for CV, C2V. So actually 5.3 is greater than 2. So the preference 
is respected. So this means that this is a preferred cluster. Um, well, here, uh, here I'm, I'm showing you uh, all the other preferences that I have um, uh, formulated. Um, I have formulated preferences for double clusters and triple clusters. Uh, so for the double clusters, uh, the first one I already mentioned, now for the final position for V, C1, C2, uh, this time uh, the... Uh, uh, that auditory distance between the, the, the consonants C1 and C2 um, is supposed to be greater than between the vowel and the C1, which as you can see is a mirror image of uh, the first preference. Then comes the preference for a medial cluster, which is a little bit more complicated because now you have uh, two consonants in the middle and the uh, vowels on both sides. So uh, if we start from the, from the middle uh, cluster, uh, the distance, the net auditory distance, uh, is supposed to be actually smaller on both sides from the distances on the left and the distance on the, on the right. So, the, so you could say that the smaller the distance between those consonants in the middle of the word, the better for the cluster, uh, with the exception of a germinant, and this is stated here as a condition that it's uh, that the distance should be, however, greater than uh, than uh, zero. Uh, maybe one thing that I did not mention um, a moment ago, yes, is that those brackets here, absolute brackets, right? So the values are absolute. So this is why uh, when one minus uh, two point three, it does not uh, it does not give us a minus uh, value. A negative value. Right and now triples uh, for for the for the three consonant clusters. Uh, the uh, initial uh, preferences, as you can see, again, it's easiest to start with the mid middle uh, C two C three, right? Two consonants which are which are uh, anchored, right? Uh, so uh, this time the net auditory distance between those consonants is supposed to be greater than the distances on both the left and, and the right. So it's as if counteracting, yeah, just counteracting the, uh, the reductions uh, uh, towards uh, CV or a parenthesis towards CV among those consonants. Uh, then for the final position, it's a um, uh, it's a similar situation as you can see. So again, net auditory distance between those C1, C2 is greater than on both sides, and then you have the most complex one, which is the middle position, where you have three consonants in the middle, and now this needs to be those in inequalities need to be uh, split into uh, into two, uh, so that. Um, on the one hand, the net between C1 and C2 is, is, is smaller than the, the, the one on the distance on the left-hand side, and then net between C2 and C3 is also smaller than the one on the right-hand side. Um, well, uh, my colleague, uh, Michał Jankowski, uh, arrived at a very beautiful matrix, or matrices really, uh, which depict uh, nicely uh, the distribution of preferred and dispreferred clusters according to those um, uh, preferences. So uh, I'm going to show you three uh, matrices for Polish um, initials, uh, Polish finals and Polish uh, medials all of them double uh, uh, clusters, right? So this one here is, uh, is uh, dub uh, double initials. And what we can observe is that the yeses, so to say, so those clusters which observe the preference are all groups, so say, to the right-hand side uh, of, the, uh, of this uh, graph, of this uh, metric, matrix or table. And, and the nose, the dispreferred, uh, take the rest of the, uh, of the space. Uh, now, if we look at finals, we see that the situation is, um, uh, is completely different. So here, the yeses uh, take the bottom of, the, uh, uh, of this matrix, of this ta table, and the nose are spread. So uh, one thing we observe immediately is, if you compare again, they do not overlap, right? Uh, the yeses do not overlap. And then finally, this is medials. And uh, as you can see that now the no's are on the right and at the bottom and the yeses take 
the, the, the rest uh, of this space, which clearly shows there is no overlapping, right, in, in the distribution of those three uh, positions which in a way verifies the correctness of the prediction, right? So there is no, no mistake in the preference, right? That actually predicts that those initial, middle and final clusters are going to be different in value. Another thing I want to say about, I'm just looking at the time. Another thing I want to, want to uh, say um, about um, this, uh, this distribution here is that it, it's on the one hand, it has, it, it, it has uh, two features. On the one hand, it is binary because it shows you both yeses and, and, and noes. So it shows you the preferred and the dispreferred clusters. However, you, it also shows you the hierarchy of preference because if you go from let's say let, left-hand um, upper corner, right, uh, down of uh, this, of this um, towards the um, right-hand bottom corner of this um, table, then the, uh, the, the preference, right, uh, we start with the highest and it gets, uh, uh, it gets a little lower and lower and lower, right? Or less and less and less. So, so this means there is also a difference, right? In, on, there is a scale of preferences among the preferred and among the dispreferred. In other words, the, some classes are more preferred than others, uh, but still preferred. Right. So, uh, so this is, the, I would say, the, the, the uh, advantage of the approach in which you use preferences rather than absolute, uh, absolute conditions. Well, in order to uh, calculate those distances uh, in the way I, I have been trying to show you, uh, we, we, I, I needed a, some tool, right? So uh, my colleagues helped me to develop a tool um, which we call that a phonotactic calculator, my colleagues David Pietral and Grzegorz Aperlinski. And this is an online tool which is available um, for, uh, under this address, I'll I'll go and show you the the, the calculator next time I mention it um, a little bit towards the end of this talk. So, uh, so thanks to, to, to the store, uh, uh, we can actually calculate the net or the distance uh, for uh, a number of languages already. Actually, there are seven at the moment. So there is English and Polish, but also German. Russian, Ukrainian, Croatian, and Georgian, which is extremely interesting because it's 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 a very rich uh, language, phonotactically speaking. Uh, right. So let me now turn on um, it, it towards uh, more phonotactics. Um, the second part in, uh, of, of this talk where, uh, where uh, and finally we will combine both uh, phonotactics and morphonotactics. So uh, phonology alone does not fully account for clusters as I mentioned at the very start. So this is why we need morphonotactics which is the area of interaction between morphonotactics and phonotactics uh, and also a subfield of morphonology. Uh, what I'm saying is that inflection, word formation, and compounding, that is major three um, uh, subfields of morphology, they all contribute to the creation of consonant clusters. And importantly, one expects relatively marked clusters across morphine boundaries and relatively unmarked within morphemes. So, so to say, I'm, I'm claiming that morphemes stay phonologically um, preferred, right? So they, they uh, um, observe uh, phonological, uh, phonological preferences, whereas across morphemes you may uh, arrive at clusters which are marked because uh, morphology actually wants to signal uh, its function there, right? So uh, by markedness it's, it's a, a good way to do it. So um, now we are talking about uh, two types of clusters. On the one hand, phonotactic clusters, which you can also call lexical, those you, which you find in the dictionary, and morphonotactic clusters, which are due to morphological operations. Um, in fact, the same cluster may have this, both phonotactic and morphonotactic status as exemplified here in English. So band and past, uh, ne de and se te, finally, are both lexical um, in those words here, but they can also be due to a morphological operation of past tense formation in band and past. 
However, we would have in each language, um, uh, with some morphology, we would have clusters which are exclusively lexical and exclusively morphonotactic. And then you also, of course, have also those mixed. So what are the sources of um, uh, morphonotactic clusters? Uh, there are various sources. Uh, here there are three subtypes. Uh, um, so one is uh, concatenation. Uh, by concatenation, you arrive at, um, at uh, uh, morphonotactic clusters, as in English, uh, laughs or loves and, or wives and, or wives. Uh, with, with those suffixes being morphonotactic, uh, or in Polish, uh, uh, initial fit, like in wtoczyć. Uh, Non-concatenative would be like in lenu in Polish, where you have vowel alternation, vowel zero alternation, uh, or you have um, plural for, uh, plural genitive, like in przestępstwo, uh, um, and then in a genitive plural przestępstw in the final position, it only arri arrives, uh, arises in Polish due to this operation. Or tratwa, uh, in plural again, genitive tratw, um, and again, this is the genitive plural. Uh, so this was non-concatenative. And finally, you also have avoidance and repair. Uh, for example, in, in Polish, you have a word ju, if it's a type of rain which does not, which lacks nominative singular, because this would be juj, which would be a, a, not only a germinate, but also devoid of a vowel. And you don't have actually words like that in Polish. Uh, so you need to avoid it. Uh, or you can, uh, you have pronunciations uh, shed for shadow, uh, third person singular, where uh, due to the, the reduction of the final consonant, the, the, the previous consonant gets voiceless. Um, so actually you have, uh, you have uh, the, 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 the new, uh, in a way, the new form shed. And uh, opitva, uh, bitev, which gets repaired. This is, you could say, the, the repair. Uh, um, instead of saying bitf, uh, you say bitf. So it's um, this vowel parenthesis help uh, actually splits the cluster. Although you can have a tf as we can as we saw in tratf. So it's not always happening. All right. So with equipped with net auditory distance on the one hand and uh, morphonotactics uh, on the other, let's have a look at some data now. Uh, the sources we used, this is now I'm referring to a project uh, and uh, the, the names of the colleagues will appear on, uh, 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 here and there. Um, uh, where we, use, uh, we used, um, or we extracted consonant sequences from three types of corpora. Uh, so there, was a, there were lemmas from uh, a dictionary, so 8,000 uh, core dictionary, 8,000 uh, items of, of core Polish, uh, so rather small. Then we, uh, however, we also produced um, a, a, a list of paradigms uh, on the basis of this dictionary for Polish nouns, adjectives, and verbs, because actually you do not find inflected or derived forms in a dictionary, right? You find basic lexical forms. So you need paradigms to see a lot of new clusters. Uh, and then we also used uh, newspaper text, so it was a written corpus. So this uh, resulted uh, in, uh, it gave us uh, 15,000 Polish consonant clusters. Uh, we formulated the following hypotheses on the basis of NAD uh, and, uh, and morphonotactics with reference to, uh, to our data. The first hypothesis was uh, that cluster size corresponds to morphological complexity. So in other words, the longer a cluster, the more likely it is to be morphonotactic. It's, it's kind of an obvious hypothesis, right? If you have more material, then you can guess it's probably going to be uh, uh, morphologically complex. Uh, the second hypothesis, the degree of phonological preferability is um, inversely proportional to morphological complexity. So here we are saying that uh, morphonotactic clusters are expected to have a, a lower degree of preferability than phonotactic ones. So uh, as I said at the very start, we, we expect them to be more marked. Uh, and finally, hypothesis three, uh, the degree of cluster preferability is directly proportional to frequency. So here uh, we are predicting that preferred clusters 
uh, are expected to be more frequent than this preferred one. So this is what we we wish, right, to happen. That if, uh, preferred classes, according to our measure, uh, should actually appear more frequently in a language. So let us now have a look at um, at the results. Well, this is uh, this is uh, uh, a table for. And for the first hypothesis, um, uh, the data from uh, the corpus for long clusters or complex clusters. And as you can see, uh, both for six and five member clusters, 100% of them are morphonotactic. So uh, it totally works for those complex clusters, right? That they are, they are all due to morphological, uh, morphological operations. They are all complex uh, morphologically. Uh, and also, uh, uh, incidentally, we can also notice that all, all medial clusters, like stem sphere or Jachin sphere or Tishon Stony so they are all medial. Also, four member clusters are mostly morphonotactic, right? So if you have four consonants in a row, it's only 5% of them that um, appear to be lexical. Um, and these are words like varstva, where you have in the, in, the, um, in the middle of the word. Um, so also a word like krvio, which is, this one is um, initial, krnombrne, uh, zdibuo, uh, and uh, and also yenderne. So very few words that would give you those complex four member clusters uh, in Polish. All the rest is also morphonotactic. So in this sense, uh, the um, the hypothesis of the uh, is totally uh, corroborated. Now let us have a look at uh, also hypothesis, still hypothesis one and the dictionary. Uh, here you have words with initial clusters. Uh, double, triple, and and uh, quadruple, uh, and again it, it is a kind of ideal graph because it shows that morphonotactic morphonotactic nature of a cluster grows with the size, um, and here you, we see that seventy percent, um, the, the right hand column, the seventy percent uh, of the um, of the four member classes are morphonotactic. We see some difference in the in the dictionary and corpus. I'll go back for a moment. So in the corpus, it was ninety five percent of four member classes. In the dictionary, it's seventy percent. So it means there are more words in in the lexicon that have. Uh, uh, lexical four member uh, four member classes. However, they are not really used. They are not really used. So, um, so actually, uh, uh, now, aha, and now this is also hypothesis one for, but for final clusters, um, and again, uh, if, here we only have two or three member classes, and uh, and again, those three member clusters are. Uh, morphonotactic, uh, here it's um, around uh, 55, it's almost 6, almost 60%, right? So, uh, so with finals, uh, we see that the, the difference is less uh, uh, dramatic. Um, all right, so we can summarize that um, for hypothesis one is that class, which was the longer cluster, the more, more likely it is to be morphonotactic. Uh, that uh, the hypothesis one has been fully corroborated and by corpus even more stronger than by a dictionary. Now for hypothesis two, uh, things look as follows. Um, so if you look at uh, the morphonotactic um, uh, clusters uh, here, in, in fact, the, uh, the absolute majority, this is 80% uh, percent, uh, of those uh, morphonotactic clusters are dispreferred. Now the blue means dispreferred, right? So they are actually dispreferred. So this means that hypothesis two, that morphonotactic clusters are going to be uh, marked, uh, is fully corroborated here, right? However, if you look at the lexical clusters, it's less, uh, it doesn't look so good, because here it's, it's, it's as if almost 50-50, right? And even, um, uh, well, a little bit more of uh, something like uh, 50 and 40, right? So uh, a little bit more of uh, um, uh, lexical classes are actually preferred, right? But we wanted them to be 
um, uh, distinctly preferred, right? Uh, so here, hypothesis two is um, uh, is much uh, it's it's much less corroborated, right? Than for the morphonotactic classes, and the same goes for uh, final uh, clusters, uh, ideal for morphonotactics. Uh, you could say that everything in the final position is morphonotactic and it's marked. Uh, however, for the for the uh, lexical clusters, it's even uh, it's even worse than for the initials because here um, uh, actually uh, more of them are uh, 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 more of them are dispreferred. So, so what happened with hypothesis two, where we said that morphonotactic classes are expected to have. Um, a lower degree of preferability. Well, the hypothesis has been corroborated with respect to morphonotactic clusters fully, but not to lexical clusters, right? Here we expect it to have a high degree of preferability, and this needs to be accounted for somehow, right? So I'll, I'll um, move on to, to this in a, in a few slides. And now let us now look at hypothesis um, three. Um, uh, hypothesis three was about frequency that we expected preferred classes to be more frequent. Um, and here, these are just five most frequent classes in the dictionary and also paradigm and corpus. Um, and you see that of the five most frequent in the dictionary, only two of them are preferred, the green ones, right? Um, and and a similar situation for paradigm corpus. There's one cluster difference here, but again, the the, the green ones, right? They 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 the only two. Two of them are uh, are preferred. So um, what we can also notice uh, at, uh, uh, in those graphs is that some of those clusters, and notably CP, but also to some extent CT, are partly morphontactic. So this would explain the uh, uh, frequency, right? That, uh, that it's not, uh, the reason is not phonological, the reason is morphological. Uh, however, we cannot really be happy with this result because uh, it, it, now the, of the five most frequent, three are dispreferred, right? And so, so, uh, so certainly this is not what we um, expect. So, um, however, um, maybe we didn't look uh, uh, well enough, right? So, so the next step was to um, to, to get a wider perspective. Um, I, I decided to look at uh, more of those uh, top uh, frequency uh, clusters. And so, if we looked at the most frequent, but in a, in a wider perspective, this gave us fourteen clusters. Uh, and here, look. Um, uh, if uh, I mean the majority are totally lexical, uh, and again, uh, as in the previous case, there is some uh, morphotactic um, nature to some super and some sit and some sicker clusters. So some of them are more some of them are morphotactic. Uh, however, importantly, only four of those fourteen are dispreferred. So pusher and s plus stop. Right. So there is a pusher cluster which is no good by NAD, and there is S plus stop classes, which are no good by NAD. All the other classes here in the 14 uh, group are, um, are good by NAD, are preferred, right? So this wider perspective, um, better um, wider picture, right, gave us, um, uh, uh, gave us um, um, more corroboration, actually, actually corroboration of the third type of, of hypothesis three, right? So, uh, so summing up, um, uh, hypothesis three has been partially corroborated, and the dispreferred clusters among the most frequent ones need separate accounts. And what these accounts are? Well, partially there is morphonotactic accounts. So we said that super and sit or even sick are partially morphonotactic. Then there is a very important uh, note to be made by the most frequent cluster of Polish, namely Pysze. It happens to be the initial cluster of three highly productive prefixes, przed, psze, and psze. So morphological productivity actually accounts for its frequency. It has nothing to do with, um, uh, with its um, phonetic makeup, right? It's actually frequent due to the fact that it's morphologically, ex it's present in extremely morphologically productive particles. 
uh, prefixes. And then for S plus stop, well, no one has ever given a good, uh, a satisfactory, a really satisfactory account for S plus stop. Uh, but one, one uh, possible account they receive is a phonetic account uh, that uh, some would say, some authors would say that they are even not clusters as such, right? Or maybe that a stop is a pre-stigmatized um, uh, pre uh, uh, segment, um, uh, etc. So there have been various accounts by colleagues, um, also, but we do know that sonority sequencing generalization, for instance, also does not really account for S plus stop clusters. Still there are, they appear in languages. Um, now, if we look now at marked clusters in, in, in the first 14 clusters in the corpus, right, because um, uh, the, the graph I showed you was 14 clusters came from a dictionary, right? So now when you look at the marked clusters in the first 14 in, in the corpus, you see that usage explains a lot here. So these were Dille. It's a cluster which is only three times in the dictionary and notably in the word la. Uh, but it has a frequency of almost 180,000 uh, in, a, in a corpus. Kutu is another one, just seven words, right? And notably words like kto and kturi, but then almost 100,000 um, uh, frequency in the corpus. So it's so used. And the same goes for gdu, uh, similarly zinu. These are words, la, kto, gdu, znaj, words like for, who, when, no, which are extremely frequently used in the corpus. So here usage actually accounts for the stability of those clusters. And this has actually nothing to do with the phonetic makeup. So summarizing uh, what, uh, what, I've, uh, what I've said uh, about um, those uh, failures, so to say, of uh, or partial failures of hypothesis uh, two and hypothesis three, well, I reckon that the reasons for partial failures are actually phonolo phonology external. So one, uh, uh, some explanations come from morphonotactics, from morphological productivity, from detailed phonetics, from usage, uh, and also comparison across pools of data. So there are important differences between dictionary data and corpus data. Uh, in summary, those uh, uh, apart from phonological accounts of clusters, we also need phonology external accounts. So the conclusions of the, the project uh, for, of the project are the following: that uh, there are actually four measures of cluster markedness or cluster complexity or preferability, if you like. So one is the size of a cluster, and this works perfectly. Uh, complexity, then net order distance, which works to some extent, then morphological complexity, which contributes a lot, and also frequency, uh, which is uh, which is a frequency of usage, which matters a lot. So if we if we now try to build a hierarchy of those measures, uh, we see that that the 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 uh, on top of the hierarchy you have size of a cluster because it always works, right? The bigger the cluster, the more complex, the more uh, marked uh, it is. Uh, then uh, morphological complexity. Then in the third place, net auditory distance, and then finally frequency. However, frequency may actually override of the other criteria and go to the, the top of this um, of this hierarchy. Uh, so, uh, but it does not mean that the most frequent cluster would be the most unmarked. It, it only means that it's most frequently used. So, um, uh, in, in part of apart from the research that I have uh, I have presented to you, um, uh, which was mainly on Polish, um, we have done other research uh, myself and and colleagues um, with the use of those criteria of NAD and morphonotactics. Uh, so we have looked at classes in German, uh, classes in language acquisition by children but also in second language, clusters in language processing. Uh, we looked at compounds in processing in a psycholinguistic experiment. Um, we looked at uh, historical change uh, uh, of clusters. We looked at dynamics of marked clusters. So we looked at, from the perspective of, of, of uh, marked clusters on uh, themselves. And we also 
uh, compared um, uh, frequent, early, and easy, whether uh, whether this all means the same thing, that frequent, early, and easy means unmarked, uh, not necessarily so. So um, I'm aware that the, the auditory distance um, estimates derived by net auditory distance are necessarily rough. Uh, and, and in particular, the influence of place of articulation differences on that is likely to be weaker than that of manner of articulation. And therefore, uh, I expect they it should be weighed accordingly, right? So, uh, so there should be more weight given to more differences than to poor differences. Uh, however, mm, um, little is known about the relative contributions of more and poor to NAD. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so, so far, I've refrained from weighing the impact. However, together with Paula pa Ozechowska, we've done some recent work. Um, it's our recent work in progress on German, where we try to, uh, thanks to some statistical analyses, try to introduce actually the weights and uh, indeed uh, give more uh, uh, importance to manner than to place. Uh, and also, uh, this, uh, I'm quoting here, referring to the work by Baumann and Wiesing, um, uh, uh, where they showed that manner of articulation seems to be re to represent the strongest selection pressure, uh, while phonation and place of articulation show less clear effects. Uh, more precisely, large differences in MOA between consonants contribute to a cluster success in diachrony and acquisition, while large uh, differences in power even to the contrary, right? So uh, with this in view, um, it, 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 it is obvious that one needs to look more carefully at the importance of more and power and the contribution of more and power into NAD. So as a result of those considerations, um, uh, oh, yes, and one more thing, that uh, as I said at the very start, vowels are not differentiated, right? So uh, uh, this is another issue, the lack of differentiation of vowel color. Uh, vowels are either more labial or more palatal or more velar, um, and this uh, needs also to be introduced into NAD, right? So consequently, I've decided to revise NAD by extending uh, MOA values uh, according to the um, hierarchy of relative sonority proposed by Parker uh, and also by introducing vowel color, which is also included in Parker's hierarchy. Uh, this is the uh, Parker's hierarchy, which is, as you can, uh, you can see, is, um, uh, is uh, uh, involved, so in, uh, uh, it has uh, um, figures some eight, 17 points on the scale rather than uh, five or six. So it is much, uh, has much higher resolution as far as uh, a manner of articulation or sonority, if you like, is concerned. Uh, and uh, rely and, and also vowels are being differentiated, right? So you have those low vowels, mid peripheral vowels, high peripheral vowels, mid interior, high interior and then come glides and all the other consonants, right? And also the consonants are differentiated according to voice. So in this way, again, finer distinctions are being introduced. And with this um, hierarchy, um, I, I introduced those, those um, new, uh, this new scale into NAD. So now the table looks much bigger um, you have 17 um, uh, uh, levels, 17 points on the on the manner of articulation uh, scale, and nine points on the place of articulation scale, and the vowels are differentiated. Right. So this um, table is now also introduced into um, uh, into the calculator, and let's see whether I can show you this yeah this it's it's an online tool as i said nat of an attack calculator and this is now the revised version for english uh, which is now quite huge and um, and uh, also you can see that you have the polish revised but also the previous version the simpler version for english polish german russian ukrainian croatian and georgian uh, so, uh, so the way so the way it works is you in, you introduce the the, the cluster you are interested in, like for instance the uh, 
uh, per rho cluster um, and uh, say the vowel so that make it uh, initial and uh, calculate uh, in legal classes. I'm sorry, I've done something wrong. So let's say per and rho, and let's say, okay, this. And now calculate, right. So uh, the calculation appears here and you see that uh, there's in this final column, you have um, uh, the answer to the question whether the class is preferred and it gives you the answer yes, but on, uh, uh, on the way you have the calculations uh, according to the preference for the initial uh, cluster and the NAT product. So you can play with that uh, if, you, if you are interested and look at other languages, like for instance, Georgian as well, right? Uh, and uh, as, as I said, uh, uh, for the time being, the revised version exists only for English and Polish, but anybody who is interested is welcome to uh, work on the revised versions for uh, other uh, languages um, as well. So. What is the outlook? I'm uh, uh, finishing now. The outlook, um, well, uh, this NAD revised uh, would be a remake of all previous results, right? So uh, in order to get a better account. So uh, we could go through all the previous, uh, previous investigations uh, and uh, redo them according to the new NAD. And then in the meantime, we have, uh, we have worked together with uh, Paulina Zedorowicz and Michał Jankowski on the uh, shape of the Polish word. So, um, uh, and in which we use a new um, uh, corpus of, 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 of um, uh, text, namely subtlex. So, which is a kind of, uh, kind of corpus in between uh, uh, written and oral. Uh, so, um, because we realized that it would be absolutely necessary to work on the uh, spoken corpus as well. Uh, so this is kind of half halfway, but there's also a PhD in progress by uh, by Alona Kononen Kososzkiewicz, who is working on spoken uh, corpus. So um, so this is really the work in progress, and NAD is uh, is uh, dynamic. Uh, and you, if you're interested, you are welcome to have a look at the uh, at the tool, uh, the phonetic calculator. Uh, some references here, and finally, thank you from Poznan. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, we thank you, Professor Katarzyna. It has been a, a very um, interesting talk. Um, I think we could uh, learn a lot about um, your work and about the, the, the NAD uh, model. Um, I was wondering, um, it, it seems very, uh, your work seems very interesting to me, uh, mainly because um, it uh, departs from the fact that we, we, we do not have to base uh, phonotetics or phonology into the syllable. And this has been, as we know, a huge problem for linguists. Um, yes. Through through the through the history of phonology, so yeah. uh, this is um, this seems very promising. Uh, this is uh, very interesting to me. Uh, at the same time, uh, when you told us that uh, your model has still uh, some problems when when dealing with a manner of articulation. Um, and when uh, you presented uh, the data on uh, preferability of uh, clusters, I was wondering um, if your model uh, can um, talk to articulatory phonology by uh, Broman and Gelstein. I don't know if you have uh, already uh, thought about it and uh, what do you think? Um, can you um, make some considerations about it? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yes, um, uh, well, as I mentioned at some point, because often I've been uh, asked why, why call this auditory distance, 
and rely on articulatory features, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, here is would be the place for your question for 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 gestures, right? Coming from articulatory phonology, because uh, instead of using features like manner or place or voice or sonority, sonor and obstruent distinction, or maybe acoustic cues, instead of these, I could of course use gestures, right? So. I haven't done that, right? But uh, but as I said, this the, the the beauty of that is that this is an idea, right? This is an idea that you need contrast, you need the distribution of distances. How those distances are measured? Uh, what um, which articulatory um, uh, uh, gestures or features or, or, or cues um, reflect our auditory imp impressions best? is the question right it's a kind of research question right so if uh, it, so, so for instance it would be great if somebody uh, were interested in in trying to compose uh, that but using um, gestures uh, uh, from articulatory phonology right yeah you're absolutely right i must admit that i haven't uh, i haven't tried right i haven't tried and i haven't thought about how um uh, how this could be done because uh, because then of course it would be um, I mean the classification of consonants according to gestures right is a completely different classification than according to uh, to manner and place because here you you are more segmental and in gestures you stop being segmental right so how do you uh, uh, how do you account for phonotactics right when you are not being, uh, not really concentrating on segments, and but this is another big issue and a question that I've also been asking myself. Um, um, actually, segments are idealizations. Actually, are they there? Right. So why? So do I when I talk about phonotactics and and you know consonants in a row? Is it just uh, what is it that I'm talking about? I mean, they don't even exist this way, right? So if you are if you if you look at that from a purely phonetic perspective, you might say, I mean, uh, this is this is an idealization which never never happens in real speech, right? So yes, I agree with you that uh, uh, that this would be one way of of trying to look at it, but I have uh, I have no idea yet how to, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, I, I didn't uh, expect you to, to have done this already, but um, I was curious about it because uh, I, um, it seems to me that um, articulatory gestures could, could be well accommodated uh, in an AD. But uh, as well as I think your, your proposal is very... Um, interesting because it uh, takes into account um, phonotactics. That is uh, an aspect that articulatory phonology, for instance, doesn't take into account. So um, it seems uh, indeed a very, a very um, interesting, very promising model. Um, and because of that, uh, I would like to pose you another question, if you, if you let me. Sure. Uh, so uh, you told us about the hierarchy of uh, measures on that uh, 42, uh, slide 42, right. I think. Something Do, you like to go? Do you want me to go back to the slide? To oh, maybe because of the ones who are watching the, the talk. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, I would appreciate it. Okay. Oops. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. okay oh. No problem. Yeah, yeah. And you mean this probably, yeah? Is oh, it? I, I can't see it. Um, no? No. Oh. Let me go back. Oops. Sharing is pause. Why is it pause? Sorry, I'll try again. And now? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. 
um, if I understood it, it correctly, um, this um, table here refers mainly to Polish and you have also done something for uh, German, is it? Yes. Am I correct? Okay. Yes. So uh, my question is that, um, do you have uh, some data, something to tell us about how this hi uh, hierarchy works uh, for other languages, such as Georgian, for example? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, uh, I, uh, one thing I want to say is that this hierarchy um, is um, it, it, uh, the, there is an assumption I assume that this hierarchy should be good for any language, right? So I would assume that it's a more of a universal nature, right? So uh, because when we looked at languages, we looked at um, uh, was uh, also. Uh, German, and I also mean the work of some colleagues in Vienna, for instance, who looked at German, and size of the cluster always works, right? So it's always on top, right? So the, the complex means marked. Also morphological complexity seems to work, right? So, so indeed, in, in, especially in languages which um, heavy inflection, inflecting languages, it works. But uh, and that so this hierarchy seems to have been confirmed, right? For uh, for German, mm -hmm. we also looked at um, the language which I didn't mention here because it's not in the calculator. Uh, but we looked at uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, and the compounds in Lithuanian, okay. and this was very interesting because for compounds and. Uh, the prediction of markedness is kind of reversed, right? So when uh, I, I said that, uh, uh, that the prediction is that uh, uh, classes at morphological boundaries are more marked, right? But this goes especially for inflection, then also for derivation. But then when you, we looked at compounds in Lithuanian, it seems it's not the case. Now, there are many uh, uh, compounds in this language and they, uh, uh, appear to become, uh, to, to start behaving like lexical items. So the middle cluster that mm -hmm. arises due to compounding is not really marked. It is preferred according to NAD, right? So, so compounds uh, tend to behave like words with medial clusters. Okay. So the, the, this, this was very interesting, right? Because, you know, on, uh, on the whole, we thought, well, compounds is also, compounding is also morphology, right? So it, yeah. the prediction about markedness should also work for, but it did not, right? So, so this is when I mentioned a psycholinguistic experiment, we, we ran a psycholinguistic experiment on English, on English compounds, right? In order to see whether this would work also for English, right? That, that, uh, that uh, uh, listeners is, would be more, I mean, users of, of the language would be more sensitive uh, to some kind of markedness, right? In, a, in a, you know, compounds like Blackbird or something, right? Okay. It did not work very well for English, right? We didn't get any significant results. Uh -huh. Only imagine for learners. So learners of English, Polish learners of English, these were, were more sensitive to those boundaries than um, the natives. So, okay. uh, so this, this, yeah, it's just one uh, experiment it's very hard to generalize anything, right? But just an observation to start with, right? So um, you also asked about Georgian. Um, we haven't done this work on Georgian yet, right? It just, uh, we started with, uh, in collaboration with a colleague in, in, in Georgia, in PDC, and uh, we just have the inventory for the calculator. Uh, and then some work has already been done, but it's not yet, uh, you know, it's not yet researched uh, and analyzed. So, okay, I, I cannot um, say. Mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, whether the uh, measures could have different weights uh, in different languages. Yeah. And what would this uh, different weight uh, uh, mean or, or, or what be the consequence of different weights of, um, of measures in this hierarchy for uh, language learning? Yeah. 
Yeah, That's this fun. is an, this, yeah, this is an extremely good question for language learning. Yes, because yes, I I as much as um, uh, I just claimed that every language has a language specific um, table for NAD, right? Uh, yeah. With manners and places, then if if we introduce weights, uh-huh. then again those weights, of course, would be also language specific. Right. Yeah. Because uh, uh, because then they, this would be a consequence. Right. Uh, I understand. Right. That um, uh, assuming in general that manner would be always more important. Still, there would be difference depending on the language. Right. And you're right that then you could actually formulate a nice prediction for acquisition yeah. that uh, a little bit like um, uh, uh, like good old Ekman's uh, idea of uh, um, marketness differential hypothesis. Do you remember that? Marketness differential hypothesis, right? That uh, yeah. when you go from a language which has less marked cluster to a more marked cluster, it's a more difficult, right? So it's about marketness. So here you could you could imagine, right, that the, those weights, uh, I I don't know yet because it's uh, what this would be like, right? But that those weights would uh, also allow you to predict the direction of difficulty, uh, uh-huh. right? Uh, yeah. uh, I suppose. I don't know how yet, right? But uh-huh. certainly this is very interesting. Now, thank you for this idea. This is, no, yeah. Okay. okay. No. Mm-hmm. And um, one last question. Um, I know you you didn't uh, mention that, and I assume uh, it is not the purpose of the model yet, but um, do you uh, um, plan, do you uh, think about uh, introducing um, uh, perception and the role of perception uh, into the um, as, uh, as a measure, for example, in this hierarchy or not? Yeah. And well, I mean, sure. I mean, it would be, uh, would, would be a, um, an ideal uh, verification uh, of uh-huh. that, right? Because, um, um, well, I had a, a student who did for, for his MA, he, he did uh, an experiment with uh, how sensitive... Um, uh, a listener is uh, to um, um, introducing an empathetic schwa in, in a given cluster, right? Be it a good cluster, bad cluster, let's say good and bad cluster, right? So uh-huh. there is an empathetic schwa in a good cluster, and then there is a, an empathetic schwa in a cluster like S plus stop, right? And the question would be um, are we more sensitive to a cluster which is which is this preferred, right? I mean, and then yeah. to, 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 when it's split, it is worse, or is when it's split, it is better, right? So this was the question, yeah. So so yeah. This, this was a purely perceptual uh, perceptual study, uh, and indeed, uh, if we introduce this uh, um, such this kind of measure, right, of perceptual sensitivity, let's say, right. Uh-huh. To the, I don't know, to how co- cohesive a cluster is, right? This would yeah. be a, um, possibly even a better measure, right? For, for, mm-hmm. for that. You are, you're right. Um, so this is, you know, the, the problem with this idea of, of that is that it's such an, a never-ending story that you have, uh, it's an uh, open end, right? That uh, yes. is, all research is open end, but but here you you, you have so many possibilities of, of going in various directions, right? Exactly. So this yeah. perceptual thing would uh, absolutely, would be, would be a, a very good thing to do, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Professor Katarzyna, I thank you. I think uh, these are the questions we had uh, to pose to you. And uh, I think the questions reflect a little bit the, um, the, the importance and the, the, um, the way that your model uh, intrigues us and offers so many possibilities for us to think about the phonotetics of clusters and uh, how can this 
uh, how can these facts be accommodated into the phonotetics and the morphophonotetics of languages? So uh, I thank you very much for your talk. And I would say it was a pleasure for me to uh, be here um, introducing the, the, the talk. And uh, well, uh, we also thank Abralin for this opportunity uh, to have such, a, such an inspiring talk. Uh, well, this morning for us here today in Brazil and this, this afternoon for you in Poland. So thank you, Professor Katarzyna. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, Adelaide. Thank you for your kind um, uh, introduction and, and to the chairing of, of the session. And I'm also very grateful to Abraline and to, to the idea of linguists online, because I think this is a wonderful idea, right? Uh, and indeed it's afternoon, but I suppose we could compare temperatures because it's 30 Celsius. It's so hot here. So I don't know, yeah? So probably here we are more or less equal, right? <laughs> Or oh, how uh, is it? Uh, no, here uh, we have something huh? uh, around 20. Uh, oh. That's why I am in south of Brazil. So yeah. Um, yeah. we of have uh, lower temperatures here. Lower temperatures, I see. So yeah. it's more nicer for at, at the moment, <laughs> right? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It have was a pleasure. a pleasure and honor. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>